Welcome to the Australian Property Investment Podcast. We tackle the big questions in property investing. Our guests are industry experts and we're fortunate to pick their brains on the challenges that investors often encounter when growing their property portfolio. Welcome to the Australian Property Investment Podcast. Let's start investing. Yeah, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, and I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, where we specialize in helping property investors start out and scale up their property portfolio. Our guest today is at that scale up side, which I'd say they've gone through a lot of the teething pains and a lot of the uh, failing forwards, as we like to call it when it comes to building a uh, thriving and quality property portfolio, which is why I'm super excited to have Sam Gordon on our episode today. Uh, if you've even scratched the surface of investing in property or looking at buyer's agents, Sam's name consistently comes up as someone that's been there, done that, and now helping others. And it's that kind of ethos where we go, tell me how you've done it, show me what the results are, and pay it forward by helping other people on their journey, rolling that up and, uh, in essence, um, that you've done all that and more. So I want to say thank you very much for giving up your time and agreeing to be on here as well, Sam. Pleasure, Welcome. mate. Pleasure. No, thanks for having me, mate. Looking forward to it. Mate, big smile. We're having a chat. I think uh, the <laughs> team here was like, hey, mate, you want to get into this episode? We're going to start, right? yeah. We're having a chin <laughs> wag beforehand, um, which I think I think just your your nature, which is uh, you're probably a sharer by nature, um, someone that's kind of um, rolled your sleeves up, got it done, and, and here you are. I don't want to kind of, you, I'm happy if you want to share how many properties you've bought, but uh, this level of experience where you've gone, hey, look, I'm I've kind of made it personally and now I want to help others succeed and win in life. That's yeah. that's what I think makes the great professionals excellent at what they do because mm. they've they've achieved what they wanted to in life and now they're happy to see others uh, achieve as well, mate. So yeah, definitely. we'll kind of come back to that. But yeah, how I, I just open is uh, <laughs> the Australian Property Scout is yes, your business. That's the one. Uh, let's talk through the the birth of, uh, of your business as well and its growth and evolution, mm. but also yourself personally. So the three P's, be about yourself personally, yeah. professionally and your property journey as well. Let's do it, man. Yeah. Let's go. So take me through the story, how you've gone to, to be bitten by the property bug. Yeah. So, uh, mate, very early on, it was funny. We were having a, the, as you say, the chin wag before <laughs> yeah. we started was all about Wollongong. Yeah. Um, and man, I grew up uh, Southern Highlands, like originally. Um, and when I kind of started, even if you wind a tad back before that, I, yeah. I left school at 16. It started year 11. Yeah. Um, pretty much just worked worked my butt off, trying to save up as much as I could. Yeah. And at the time, I was trying to save for a, for a Jap car. Like, I, <laughs> I love Toyota Supras. It was... Mate, you and I, but I still look at them. It's like, uh, why? I still look at them. My, my wife is like, you're not driving that. She'd be embarrassed. I was like, you don't understand. This is like deeply rooted in like, I don't know, the first Fast and Furious exactly. perhaps. That's, yeah. how I always, that's how I always describe it, man. It's like, it's our generation of like the Fast and Furious sort of when they first came out in the Supras and the Skyline. Correct. And everything, yeah. um, and that's what I was saving for. Um, I was probably pretty fortunate, like pretty lucky that my old boy was a mechanic by trade. Yeah, um, and so I take him to these inspections, and he just rubbish every oh, single same. car. My dad was a mechanic, and it's like you're not everything. buying that. I was like, <laughs> why do we just not worry about the engine for once and how good I look in this thing? <laughs> that's it. So man, yeah, it was pretty much exactly the same thing. Um, and he kept just trying to talk me out of all these cars, and just yeah. really just like giving him every single one a bad rap. I got yeah. over it after a while. Um, but I still was saving really diligently. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, he said to me once, it was funny, man, like I've never really kind of had like a direct mentor or anything. Mm. Um, but I remember one of the first things, early things he'd said to me was just like, man, why don't you look at, why don't you buy a property instead? Mm. And I'd always remembered hearing over the years that like super wealthy people that either make their money in property or they park their money in, they, they park their wealth in property once they've made well it. Said. Um, and so, yeah, man, I kind of just started looking into it. I was, um, I couldn't afford very much. Like I was kind of like a 250, 275K yeah. sort of budget. Like that was everything I the had to spend. The first purchase is the worst <laughs> time in your life. It's you so hard, earn the lease yeah. and, you, and you save the lease. Yes. Yeah, it's the worst <laughs> the, of both worlds. The first deal is always the hardest. Yeah. It's always the hardest. But if you get it right, it can be an awesome platform and, and, yeah. and sort of building point for it as well. Um, and that's what I really found. So um, I bought the first one in, I was 19 um, back wow. in 2009. Um, bought a little two bedroom, um, three story walk up in, uh, in Wollongong. Yeah. Um, and it was good, man. It turned out to be a really good investment. Um, it taught me a lot of things as well, um, buying below market, renovating yeah. for profit. Um, it also taught me about negative gearing and, and, and how much I didn't like that strategy, especially yeah. as a low income earner, um, and that it really wasn't for me. Um, but it performed really well. Um, I, I, that's, that was the first property I actually ever sold as well, but I sold it, uh, a fair few deals down the track as well. But yeah. that was where I really got bitten by it. Um, there's a funny story too. 
I bought it. I was kind of going through the renovations and I went to the dentist. And when I was sitting in the yeah. dentist, he had an API, which is Australian property uh, investor yeah. mag from way back in the day, sitting on the table. Um, and I picked it up and I was, it was, I'm never early, right? I'm very, very rarely ever <laughs> early, right? And, and he was never late. And for some reason, this one time, he, like we were both in Wait. out of sync, you know, yeah. and I was early, he was late. And I spent about 15 minutes reading this thing. And then by the time I left, I asked him if I could take the mag. He said yes. And then I went to the um, news agent and just bought, there was three magazines at the time. Mm. I bought all three, subscribed to all three and just consumed content like nonstop. And then wow. just all these strategies started building in my head. And it was really cool. Um, I know that's why you like to get investor stories on as well. It was yeah. really cool to hear about how, how other people were doing well or what they'd done Wasn't well. Wasn't that the highlight of picking up those magazines? Yeah. Which is you'd flick straight to like investor the spotlight. Stories. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always, man. And that was it. And I learned so much from people, even people's mistakes that they tried to, they try to make things sound like they were great. And you're like, if you, if you read deeply into it, you could pick the holes apart of what they'd sort of done right. wrong, which was awesome. Um, and then pick apart the guys that had done really well and what they'd done as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, man, that was pretty much it. And I just, I, I, I kept dabbling in all these different little, I did it. And the next up a couple of years later, I did a buy and build in the Highlands. Okay. Um, and then I started, and then I started investing more for cash flow and then discounts and, and then really realizing timing cycles, buying at a discount, getting a good yield. Like that yeah. was, that was where it really started to, to hum. Yeah. Um, where I started. And all this mm. kind of. DIY at this yeah. point, have you got anyone that's in your corner no. kind of helping you? It was the magazines, man. So it's yeah, like right. magazines back then were like the podcast of today. Totally. Right? You know, so totally. like, man, I literally consumed those things like nonstop for years and years. Yeah. Um, we started out, when we started our business, mm. I subscribed to 150 copies every month yeah. and I'd put them in the mail to clients. No way. Yeah, mate. Yeah, right. And um, that really got that traction because that's yeah, yeah. Our, our ideal clients and investors. I was yeah. like, here, I have the knowledge, mate. We'll give it to you for mm. free but put some good knowledge into your, into yeah. your ears. So yeah, yeah same man, thing. it was awesome. Eh? It was so yeah. much good stuff in them. So yeah, yeah, that's really where it all built. And then, yeah, I started buying two a year, then three a year and six a year, 10 a year, just kind of started going crazy, Unreal. you know? So that's that snowball good. success, I guess. Yeah. You get to the point now where it's like, you almost, uh, I think what we're trying to say is decision fatigue, where you got to say yes to less and mm. like, you got to kind of, know when to say no. Yeah. How did you kind of go to the point that you're knocking out properties saying yes to this opportunity, for example, because anything looks like a good opportunity, mm. right? At the time you're like, oh yeah, I can do it. I can do it. I can see the value <laughs> in it. Um, it always came down to, to proper value. So like okay. um, that was, and that's how I've always been. Like I've always got to buy things at a discount, even still, man, like I've done pretty well for myself. I'm pretty wealthy these days. Yeah. I still will buy whatever's on sale at Woolies and Coles. Man, it's just like, it's just <laughs> hardwired you know? for a bargain. Man, a hundred percent. Like, I don't think it'll ever change. Yeah. And, and I think like when that's the way it is, and then you're always hunting for that bargain and that deal, you, you know, you, you, you won't buy something that's not that. So yeah. I feel like that's where, you know, I just got, got really good at sniffing out a deal. Um, and yeah, man, I, I love it as well. I love the, you know, like they talk about like the art of the deal, or like the hustle of, of putting mm. something together. Like, oh, I love that. Cause it's, it's, uh, it's an adrenaline rush, you know, when you get yeah. these good things together. Probably doesn't hit me as much these days um, as it did back in the day, oh, but it's sure. cool because these days I get to do it for clients. Yes. Um, and when you see, you know, a guy comes in, he's got 60 grand, you can make him half of that on the way into a deal. He's literally halfway to his next deposit. Mm. If you've also bought it in the right area and does 10% that year, within 12 months, he's got a deposit to well buy said. another or, or faster. Well said. Um, so that's how I love it, man. When we talk about, I guess, the negotiation part, I get, well, I had some clients and the conversation goes and it's like, you make your money on your buy mm. well, for example. Um, and one, one um, counter that I had is someone's like, well, you buy an expensive watch, you pay retail, like you pay the, mm -hmm. you're not going to get a discount on yeah, quality. Yeah. And do you get that from time to time where people go, how do you get discounts on, if it's mm. real quality, why would they discount the price, yeah, yeah. for example? Yeah, man, like there's always, everyone's circumstances are different, right? So there will always be, call it 10% of the market that has to sell quickly or they want to sell cleanly off market. They right. don't want to have the, they don't want to have a hassle of a sale. So to yeah. get a top dollar on something, it's a hassle. It's a negotiation. If someone wants top dollar, it's the same thing. Agents and sellers have got to push for that top dollar. Yeah. There's always 10 to 20% of the market. They don't want to go through that. Maybe they've owned the property for 30 years and, you know, 30 grand to them it may not be that much if it's debt free um, mm -hmm. or they may need to get out of the deal really quickly. Like now is a, is an ideal time. Like when you look at it um, of those exact things, like we actually had heaps of it. We're recording in the first week of July yep. in the last two weeks of, of June, we had this huge rush and influx of all these agents coming to us going, uh -huh. these guys realize they need to sell because of interest rates, they yes. want to get it into this financial year. They don't, we don't have time to go to market. What can you get us? Literally, what can you get us? Not even this is what they're, they're after. Wow. Sometimes that, but a lot yeah. of the time it's what can you get us? So we, we snagged some absolutely ridiculous deals like in those last two weeks. 
But there's always there's always situations like that. Mm. You know, everyone's situation is different. Not everyone has the time or the luxury to wait for top dollar. Um, and so yeah, there's, there's just, it's just looking for that opportunity and being patient. It was like you said before about like how do you how do you pick apart the right deal? It's just being patient, not rushing. Mm. That's probably the biggest mistake I see people make. You probably do as well. They go take some. Let's say it takes two months to get a pre-approval, especially like in the crazy <laughs> times of COVID. No, no, every, everyone's different, right? But yeah. different people, or maybe they've saved, it's taken them two years to save for a deposit. And then yes. they get the deposit, they get a pre-approval in a week and then they bought something in a week. And, and it's like, mate, you just took two years. Like don't make Spot a snap on. decision. Take your time and make sure it's 100%. Yeah. Unless they did research for this, say six months, three, six months leading up to it. Yeah. It's all about, you know, being, being really... Um, correct and finite with that. Yeah, it's that rush of blood sometimes where it's yeah. like the first one, they're like, we're falling in love <laughs> with it. I was like, I don't know. I don't know you guys, but I say generally it's uh, our average at the moment is probably looking at about 25 to 40 properties yep. thereabouts. Yep. So you think about it, you're going to see one or two properties every week mm. over a two or three month period. Yep. That's where we get our stat from. Mm. Um, our time to go from a pre-approval to pulling the trigger on yep. a, on a, and putting pen to paper on a contract to sale is somewhere they've looked at about 20 odd properties or mm. they've missed out on a couple, yeah. gone to auctions, for example, mm. You're probably the same way you kind of go, your trained eye is going, that whole analogy of John West, they, you know, <laughs> John rejects the uh, <laughs> biggest, the best, whatever the tagline is. <laughs> it's a bit like what buyers agents go through. Yeah. Like they're rejecting a, mm. a, a large amount to the untrained eye. So, hey, what's wrong with that? Mm. So take me through like the secret source or due diligence that you're going through to, to reject versus approval yeah. or shortlist as well. Yeah, man, it's a great, it's actually a great question. It's funny, man. No one's ever asked me that, right? Because <laughs> it, it literally, man, it's a great question because I ask every buyer's agent that because really? I'm like, how... Mm. that's what clients effectively are paying you yes. for, which is it's almost an insurance policy mm. against brain damage on buying the yeah. wrong asset. What you've got to be super careful of is we've seen a lot of buyer's agents out there and I actually got burnt by a buyer's agent um, a few years ago as well, back when I was 26, I think it was. I'm right. 33 now, so yeah. it was a while ago. Uh, 33, but, baby face, bloody <laughs> hell. <laughs> but it's what, man, it's what gets me, it's what got me into it. I know we're going <laughs> to dive into that in a sec. But, um, but yeah, man, it's it was one of those things that... Um, triggered me with it and, and I see it a lot still these days of, of you know, sometimes the deals is off market. So then they can, they'll sell it to a client as being a great deal because it's off market. Mm. Um, but realistically off market doesn't mean anything. It just means yeah. you're getting access to it before it hits the market. It doesn't yeah. mean it's a great deal. Um, it all comes down to learning your market intimately. So you know when I said before, like bef if you're gonna do it yourself, it's like three to six months, you should be researching a market before you pull the trigger on something. Yes, You can't learn a market for two weeks looking at realestate.com and seeing what's trading, especially right now we're in like, the tightest stock market the country's yes. ever seen. Yeah. Um, man, if you're if all you're seeing is what's coming through and selling online, like they're, they're, they're the they they have probably been passed on almost every deal by a buyer's agent um, that had the opportunity to buy it off market, and they're probably going for market value mm. um, or potentially above. So the real key thing, especially with what we do, is just knowing that market intimately and seeing value in that deal, or okay. where can we add value on that deal? Like where does it really come into it? Where um, it's, it's essentially a deal. Like wh what makes it a deal yeah. um, will really come down to that value that comes through. So maybe we would reject probably 500, at least 500 deals a month, I reckon. Like individually with the BAs and the team, man, we all get sent. It'd be 20 plus properties a week. Mm. We, we all would get sent. You might buy a handful from that each, max. max yeah. Maybe one or two a week each week we're probably buying. Yeah. But like, look at that. That's, that's a 5%, you know, close on, on what we get sent. Um, and realistically, that's what a, uh, an excellent buyer's agent should do. Spot they on. should get access to a, a heap of stock, but only buy that small portion that is actually exactly. deal, deal quality and deal grade. Okay. And, and that's the thing, man, like the idea of like, you know, whatever you pay is retail and, and it's about, it's not, man. When it comes to, when it comes to actually anything, like, yes, when you go into a store that you can't haggle someone down on, right? But realistically, when it comes to something like this, it's such a big dollar, big ticket item. There's always discounts to be had because everyone's situation is different. Mm -hmm. Some people will, will will be happy to hold out, but not everyone's happy to hold out. Some people need to go quickly or for whatever reason. Yeah. So always looking for those opportunities and, and, and where can we pounce and sounds bad but exploit that opportunity oh, mate, for our a, client you know so and shoot goes on the other foot i mean you're dealing with trained real estate agents yes. who are expert negotiators i mean they look at Eric and they've got yeah. like you know they've got like an fbi negotiator talking about how to you know mm. the art of the negotiation 100 uh, right so <laughs> i say this to clients i'm like you go up against a real estate agent yeah. and you've never and bought before you never bought before or you're going to go with an offer at 1050 yeah. and it's like they know there's juice there, there's a squeeze there right no one comes in with a round numbered <laughs> offer and it's like that's the max that you've got there's they know they, there's yeah. more there left to squeeze yeah, and get every dollar that they can out of you and they're doing their job for their client yeah. right just like you're doing your job yeah. for your client who's paying you to get the lowest value mm. the lowest highest value lowest price yes. the agent wants the highest yeah. price um, i, I think man it's a great point you make because so many australians they think they know how to do it or they think they can do it yes um but literally you're working against 
you're working against people who do it every day from a negotiation side, That's from right. the sales, but you're also working against essentially the buyers agents that do it every day Correct. as well. Because like we don't hunt on the weekends or in the nights on our time off. Yeah, we do as well, but we also do it you day know, job. eight till six as well every, every single day too. So it's not like it's yeah. just like the side hobby. It's literally a full-time profession yeah. um, from the negotiation to the sourcing, to the relationship building, to getting access to everything and, mm. and even all the different avenues of getting access. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's so much to it, man. Yeah, well said. Well said. Uh, you, you just mentioned before, we're, yeah, we're recording this first week in July, kick yeah. off a new financial year. Some people have aspirations to buy this year, for example. You mentioned kind of mid-year clear out on stock, for mm. example, as well. We do. You've probably got a few, you know, potential clients that are coming through going, oh, look, I'm, I'm thinking about investing next year or this is just not the right time. I'm going to sit this market out. Mm. Um, so <laughs> sales agenda aside, because yeah. you and I have no vested interest yeah. when, when they buy, I mean, I talked to a client yesterday. I spoke to them initially three and a half years ago. Yeah, now yeah. they're back. I've had those. Uh, right. And so <laughs> just purely being around for time, you get yeah, you know, yeah. people that, uh, people that return to us as well. Um, so what's your counter or what's mm. your, what would be your rebuttal to someone going, is this the right time to buy? Mm. I don't think it is. There is always a location that's worth buying in, right? right? So people say, like you said earlier, like people, yeah, you know, you always make your money on the way in. Yeah. You make a portion of your money on the way in, yeah, right? Like the right location will do 80 to 90% of the heavy lifting. You can mm. make 10 to 20, but you're not making 80 to 90 on the way into a deal. So true. Yeah. So if you're timing markets correctly and you're going and buying into the right markets at the right time, yeah. Um, man, that's what's going to do the heavy lifting, right? Um, to say that there's no markets that are going to produce that. It's like you look at majority of the country last year went backwards. I could name you over half a dozen locations that did 20 to 30% growth last year. You know, yeah, right. you're buying a 400K asset, it's $100,000 in growth in 12 months and it's doing it again this year. Um, and it will do it again next year. And there'll be other markets that will do, do it as well. So like their markets move in their different cycles. Different markets are extremely affordable. Then different projects will come into an area that will just put it on fire. Mm. Um, there's always locations that are worth investing in. If you have a look, there's actually a really interesting graph out there. I can't remember on what platform it's on. Yeah. But it shows over the last 30 years all the capital cities, right? So it doesn't yes. even take into account the regional centers and yep. hubs, right? It's just the capital cities. There is always at least one or two locations like going through significant booms at any one time. Mm. Um, the issue is, is that majority of the Australian headlines are on Melbourne and Sydney because <laughs> more than half of the country lives in those two cities, right? Combined. Yeah. Um, so I think like when you take that out of the equation, you actually look at it from a, from a macro level. Um, and what is the country doing? There, there's always like literally if, if you go find the, I'll, I'll try and dig it out and I'll send it to you. But if you yeah. go, if you find that and you have a look at that, um, there is always somewhere growing. Mm. Um, it's, it's always the case. And when I say growing, markets don't do, there's this old adage that markets double every seven to 10 years. And then, is that true? so people think it's or seven to 10% a year gets that seven to 10. Yeah. It never happens, right? Like almost every city sits stagnant for over, a, for a decade or more before it starts its run. And then it doubles in about three or four years. You look at Sydney, people are like, no, nah, no, nah, but look, but what about Sydney? And people forget in 2003 to 2013, you could buy a property cheaper in 2012 than you could in 2003. Wow. There was 10 years where the market slowly slid back and then it doubled in three mm. and a half years. Um, and this is where there's always those opportunities, but you look at that, that stagnant period for 10 years, if you were in Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide, um, majority of regional centers in the country, you would yeah. have doubled your money in that time frame so there's always somewhere to double your money to make significant gains um, and then there's always places to to avoid during those windows as well mm. so yeah I'm, I'm i'm a very active like i almost call myself like a trader with property i yeah i have two different strategies i love cash flow um so we'll target and, and we produce and, and manufacture high yielding high cash flow deals yeah um and for us like they're the deals we want to hold forever but then we have our other deals which is what we call our bread and butters um they're essentially growth properties for me, growth properties are, are there to get in and get out. So you want to a enter a market early. You like that example. Let's say you buy in 2012, yeah, um, in Sydney, and then whether you whether you sell out in 2017 or whether you carry it all the way through, you know, mm. for, for two cycles. But realistically, if you'd bought in at 2012 and sold in 2017, you would have more than doubled your not not just your deposit your money. I'm talking about your purchase price. Yeah, you know, yeah. so it's significant ROI on actual capital into deal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, like if you hold it beyond that period, you actually, it's almost like losing money with inflation with that 10 year stagnant period because yeah. you could pull it out, put it into a different market and double it again. Yeah. So that's the way that I roll and that's the way that I play with property when it comes to growth. Yeah. And I guess the, uh, we literally had this conversation before with another guest, which yeah. is the cash flow. It's, you, it's tangible. You can, you, can, yes. you can see it, you can bank it, for yep. example. The capital growth side, you've, you've built your portfolio off the back of capital growth mm. to, to pull the equity out to go again to, yeah. to, to, to 
uh, upgrade your, your portfolio. So the capital growth is the necessity. I think you call mm. it your bread and butter, for example, yeah, yeah. And that's what you need. Um, but it's harder it's harder to make that tangible because it's the future and you can't both you can't are necessary. predict it. Yeah, yeah, both are super necessary because yeah. you can't build one. You can't just keep building on growth, nor oh, can great. you keep well, you, building on cash flow. Either, and we see it. You probably, the two hindrances for an investor is running out of borrowing capacity or running out of equity. Capital, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, and quite often they're kind of faced with two and that just yeah. the frustrated investor <laughs> comes in, right? Um, <laughs> so I guess the... Looking forward, and you're probably talking to other clients where you know they've probably got the ability, and now it's like, mm. well, rising interest rates, um, and I guess that that um, that handcuff as yep. well. How are you having those conversations with people going? Yeah, it's a little bit tougher from an investment side as well, or is it really? It's just part yeah. of the cycle. Yeah. So like two percent interest rates were completely out of <laughs> cycle. You know what I mean? Like they were ridiculously cheap. Yeah. I think the biggest issue is people have gotten used to 2% interest rates, 2 oh, or 3%. Right. So got now they've got addicted to it. 100%. <laughs> yeah. I, I did, man. Like it was amazing. It was the best, but it was never going to last. Yeah. You know, and, and, and man, I saw people out there putting modeling out with 2 to 3% interest rates, like for cash flow and like for long term. And I'm like, man, it's never going to stay like that. Mm. You know, and, and, and you and I both, though long term rates are typically somewhere between any, six yeah, five to, to six. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In terms of that long term interest rate that we're Which we'll is probably why the banks you, you were using 7.5%. 0.25% as their assessment so, rate because yeah, yeah, it was so a 30 year average, yeah, right? Yeah, hundred percent. So, um, so yeah, man, I feel like it's, it's, there's always a good time to be, to be getting in and to be investing. Yeah. yeah people are like a little more nervous around it as well, but mate, if something costs you, I always look at it. Like if something costs you two, three grand a year, but even if just on really low, even if it was five grand a year, but it was making you 40 grand a year in growth or 30, 40 grand a year in growth. Mm. It's, it's a no brainer for me. Something I always say to clients, our deals very, very rarely ever get to a 5,000 per annum net negative. Like even at today's interest rates, they very rarely ever get there. Yeah. But I'm like, if we can make a 20 on the way into a deal on a $400,000 property and it grows 10% in the next 12 months, that's sixty thousand dollars. Would you give five grand to get sixty? Yeah, of course you will. You know, like it's a, when you put it. I think when you put it in that, it's a no brainer. But people just see the five or the three, or they see the red cash flow sheet. With, you know, the little red balance, and it's like, oh my god, the brain can't get past. The yeah. brain actually can't get past it. It's <laughs> like the monkey brain kicks in. And it's like, bum bum, wrong deal. Uh, yeah, and I but think it's but it's part of it. You know, it's, it's all part of it. Current interest rate environment. That's fine. Yeah. You and I both know it's going to come back at some point soon anyway. Yeah. Um, but it's it's part of the game. You're going to sit out and, and do your dough on on not making that growth in now for yeah. the sake of let's say 5k per deal in the next in the next couple of years mm. um or you're going to sit out and jump back in when everyone else jumps back in and have missed that cycle yeah. so yeah um you're probably a bit like us where you've got maybe a classic bell curve of clients so you've got probably that top 10 percent that are ambitious going to grow market resilient yeah, in yeah. terms of that don't care they, they don't really care i've got the ability to go again <laughs> draw that equity out let's go again buy another yeah. bad boy and you've got this i think that middle tier which is rate sensitive, mm. market f sensitive, for example, yeah. will move when the herd moves, for example, mm. and you've got these last 10%, which they're, they're a little bit hamstrung in the sense they, yeah. they're pretty maxed out or yeah. they don't really have that as ambitions to grow. Mm. So how are you, I guess there's two parts to it. How are you serving that top tier, which are yeah. highly ambitious, you know, they're gonna move to their goals, mm. and they're gonna execute their plan to absolute perfection. Yeah. And then you've got this other middle tier, which you know they've got, it's almost like at school, uh, has potential, uh, maybe is just you know influenced by other kids. <laughs> Need to apply themselves that was a, more. That was a report card. <laughs> uh, has, has a lot of potential, but needs to apply themselves yeah, more, yeah. Uh, which is the story of my life. Um, <laughs> so how are you kind of moving the needle with those type of clients yeah. versus your top tier clients as well, mate? We're probably lucky in the sense of I, I, aggre I sorry invest pretty aggressively and i got like a pretty um, uh, forward approach and I seem to attract a lot of clients that are like that as well. Nice so I'm, I'm pretty fortunate from that perspective. A lot of guys are just like, they know you invest when you can invest and they, and so they'll keep, you know, they'll keep pushing and buying as many as they can, especially when there's, we can pull equity and we do cash flow deals. They can keep building the portfolio and keep growing. So we're very fortunate that a majority of our clients are actually sit on, sit in that echelon uh, yeah, essentially nice. of clients. Yeah. Um, for the rest of the guys, it just comes around the education. Um, so it really just comes back to stripping it back to like those examples before of like, you know, yes, it may, it may cost this during this time frame, but then just spelling out, this is this is what we're looking at moving forward and they're, mm. they're very conservative estimations as well obviously like kind of what i gave you before yeah. those locations 20 30 percent you know yeah. in a 12 month window saying 10 percent is quite conservative so i think once you spell it out on that end um and when you're making a discount on the way in as well that's really what i think sets the sets the pace for a lot of people just to understand to be able to get past it and all they need to do is trust us to pull the trigger on one deal 
and then they see the result and then they fall into the the top bracket because they're like, okay, that actually worked. Mm. It did grow. Who cares if it costs us five? Because in a 12-month window, we pulled out 60 or something like that. Yeah. And I think they're the moments where people, their perception changes and they're like, and literally that's when they fall then into that top category. I think that's why we have so many people in that um, because we have so many repeat clients that have had the win on one, two, three, four deals, whatever. Yeah, um, nice. And they've just they've had the win and they keep having the win and the properties keep performing. And then the, come time, the time comes where it might be time to sell yeah. um, or it might be time to say build a granny flat or something and they pull the trigger and then they get the results. And so all these things just keep moving the needle and that just keeps building our, our um, essentially our client base, those guys that understand it because yeah. it's worked for them. So I think that's the, that's the biggest thing. And, and I think when it comes to, to BAs, especially that you've got to work with someone that's done what you want to do and like Spot realistically on. done what you, what you want to do yeah. um, with a really good track record of helping other clients with it as well. And then, you know, you can invest, you can invest in them and with them and back them to, to help you get those same results. Well said. Yeah. Well said. If you want to be led, um, slightly different tack yeah. if I can. Yeah. Um, the home ownership crisis, yep. right? I, I read a couple of these articles occasionally just to kind of get my finger on the pulse and what's what's the litmus test for the for the public opinion. <laughs> um, and then you get some some ideas thrown around going like we're going to cap rents, for example, or freeze yeah. rents, which will impact mm. the investor. Um, or it's like, hey, investors should be capped at a number of properties that they own. <laughs> highly, highly controversial. <laughs> um, trying to tell people how many properties they can own. And then you kind of you hear an occasional story about a buyer's agent. Here's how many properties I own. And the mm. comments are just like, oh, yeah. how dare someone own that many yeah, properties yeah, yeah. and others are I've struggling. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. They didn't want to put you in it, but <laughs> I've, I've seen it, right? Yeah, and, yeah of course. Um, and I'm going to punish people for taking action. I'm like, mm. oh, where do we draw the line here? Yeah. So two parts of the question. Um, do you feel guilty for your success is one part. And okay. um, <laughs> and the other part is... How do we how do we solve the home ownership mm. crisis? Because there is there is definitely a, an issue here as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll answer your second one first. Yeah. Um, because with the home ownership crisis, I think the the thing that I look at is is my timing of when I I wouldn't say I was that lucky because I bought into Sydney in two thousand nine. No, I don't use the word luck. Luck mm. is you had the ability and you had the attitude, yeah. so you make your own no, luck. Right? Yeah, no, yeah. I understand completely. Um, uh, yeah, it's 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 a tricky Fortune, one because yeah. now the reason I say it is because now for somebody in my position back then, like when I bought my first property, I was making thirty nine grand a year, like hey, nothing. Great. You know great. what I mean? And to buy that first one, if you were making that now, you, you can't buy in Sydney, and yeah, that's you'd why be I'm struggling saying. to pay your rent. Yeah, right. Yeah, hundred like percent. Yeah, and that's why, like you know, I use that example because it comes down to where you live. Yeah, and if you live in Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Hobart, probably most most centers in Australia, you, you there is probably somewhere you could afford to, to buy within that within that city still. Yeah. But it depends if it's where you want to live. Mm. Um, and this is where I think the 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 big thing that is massive these days is rent vesting. Yeah. Um and like I still do it. I I um for the first eight years of my profit, so I'm 14 plus years into my investment journey now. Yeah. For my first eight years, I lived in my own house until I realized the power of rent vesting. Yeah. Um, and I realized what I wanted to buy, which funnily enough is, is pretty close to where you live now as well. <laughs> um, it was like well outside my, my reach at the time. Yeah. But as my portfolio kept growing, so did my aspirations of what I wanted to buy to, to live in. Yeah. So it just, it hasn't made sense yet to buy anything as a primary residence. So I still rent vest. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the big things is like people think, and yes, it is to an extent home ownership out of reach for a lot of people starting out, but it's because their their level of what they want to buy, it's like what their parents own who are 40, 30, 40 years older than you them. You don't start where someone's finished. No. And it's a very hard conversation to have yes. because you take our area down, you know, Wollongong, yeah. the Illawarra, for example, typically kids could buy in the area. Yeah. Uh, in Sydney, that ship sailed years oh, ago. Yeah, ages it, ago. It wasn't even a thing you did. Yeah. You never bought where your parents yeah. lived. But some of those other areas yep. where I was like, hey, the kids could be 10 minutes from us. Mm. And that was the allure of being down the coast, yeah. from central coast and above. Yeah. That's not achievable. Mm. Yeah. So the, yeah, that, that, that conundrum is there for a lot of those communities that are wrestling what Sydney and Melbourne had yeah. for years. Yeah. But I think this is where it just comes into, you know, rent where you re – like it's a – and this kind of goes back to your first question, do I feel guilty? No, because I made a lot of sacrifices along my journey. Like yeah. I went seven years where I didn't travel. And all, every time I had a holiday, yeah. I went and renovated a property. Like every every year, I, I used to have two holidays a year. Yeah. Two in the two. When you could claim the travel. <laughs> yeah. Man, I used to sleep in my ute. I couldn't afford to pay for a hotel. You know I'm what I mean? Glad like you said just... it, mate. I'm glad you said it because we literally had Trinity out. One of our team members come yeah, in. Yeah. She's 23. Yeah. Uh, two properties. Yeah. And she Good said, I haven't traveled overseas. Yeah. And I'm like, mate, every 23 year old's chomping at the bit to go overseas and put yeah, over bloody yeah, Insta. And yeah. she's 
No, two properties yeah. and she will travel yeah. when the time is right. Yeah. But yeah, making sacrifices is not the popular conversation mm. to have. Yeah, definitely not. Dude, when I was 20 or 21 or something, I did two. Um, you could actually travel pretty cheap back then. I think I went yeah. to Fiji, cheapest <laughs> chips, right? And then I went to Canada. Um, and again, it was pretty, it was like a three, four grand trip. Yeah. Um, and then that was at 20, and the Aussie dollar went further than what it did today. Yeah, it was good. It was like a dollar 10, man. It was yeah, massive, so I right? I on that too. <laughs> but man... Um, that was 21 and I didn't travel again until 28 when I was, when I, I went to Europe in 28 yeah. and, and those whole seven years there, all I did was invest and soccer season had finished. I'd already have, I'd already have the vacancy ready so I could drive straight to a place as soon as the season finished yeah. um, and renovate that place completely. The two years over, over Christmas, I do the same thing. I drive somewhere, I drive anywhere and then go renovate my properties. And I literally just did that for seven years. It's like the, the guilty question. It's just like, definitely not. Like if someone mm. wants to put in what I've put in. Like you, you can't have a whinge because if you put in what I put in, you would be at a really good spot. You wouldn't be struggling, you know, let's say. Yeah. And I think the sacrifice part, like you say, with Trinity there, like what she's done is amazing. Um, it's absolutely crazy to have achieved that. Mm. Um, you know, and hats off to her because so many people wouldn't make that sacrifice. Yeah. But I think what's important is like making that sacrifice when you're young. Yeah. Um, even if you do it for one or two years, even if it's living back at home with mum or dad so or living true. somewhere cheap, renting with a mate or something like that for a couple of years and investing interstate you know, investing in a regional hub or somewhere else that you can actually afford to buy that's in mm. a great point in its cycle, make a margin, make a discount on the way in, buy at a right point where it's going to grow for you, have a good cash flow so it takes care of itself. Yeah. You start to buy two, three, let's say you get three of them and you got over a million dollars worth of property, even if you, even if that's all you did and then you went and did a couple of Euro, European trips or whatever so in, in the years after it, you got a million dollars worth of property and then it has a nice run, goes up to one and a half, two mil. Yeah. Is half a well. mil to a mil in equity, you know, essentially that you've just made there in yeah. profit. So um, I think people have to look at it from that. Everyone's like, I want everything and I want it now. And it's it's just not possible. You know, mm. you have to be realistic with with the journey. Property is not a an immediate thing. It takes time. Like I've I've done pretty well, but I'm also almost 15 years in, you know, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a huge amount of Overnight time. success, 15 years in the making. Yeah, that's it, man. Yeah, I feel like, and the reason I kind of ask that question is mm. no one would, slam you for your business success because there's hard work, there's grit, there's yeah, failure yeah. that typically happens, there's a roller coaster. <laughs> but when people have done well from a property side, everyone's really quick to turn and take mm. a few pot shots. So I'm like, there's no different. Uh, uh, investing in properties, best investing in business yeah. and another asset class, both you've had to make huge sacrifices, yeah. fail forward, brain damage on the way mm. through, heaps of lessons learned, usually expensive lessons. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you see the finished product where they've had to push through. You've probably been told so many times by mm. banks, no, yeah. it's find a way to get, yes, you missed out on properties that you wanted. And yeah, 100%. The resilience is such an underrated quality. Mm. It's it's so easy to go, the market's hard. And I often quote this article that SMH is saying, what, 10% of Australians can go on and buy a property. I was like, you peddle that message and people are going to buy into that message. 100%. You, you put this message out here that, hey, look, someone can actually go on and acquire X number of properties mm. and here's how to do it. It almost feels like it's a sales pitch. It's like, well, hang on, mate. Here's just a blueprint if you want to. It's yeah. not you, it's someone else, yeah. but it can be done in mm. this country, right? I've had clients on 60, 70 grand and they Spot come on. to me 50, 60 grand and Spot we get them on. three deals in I can 12, do, 18 months. Mate, you know I can I mean? do more with clients that are earning 65 yeah. grand than 260 because yeah, yeah. the 260 grand clients but, have a lifestyle. Yeah, they that live on that. Yeah, they live that lifestyle. It's the, yeah, 100%. the vehicles, the <laughs> holidays, the bottles yeah. of wine. You know, I'm like, I can't, I can't rein your lifestyle yeah. in. It's at a certain standard. And yeah. Yeah, I live at a certain standard too, mm. but man, I yeah. traded my car in and bought a really cheap car in cash. <laughs> and the first question everyone asked was, is business not going well? I'm like, it's actually going that okay that I can trade the car and not have yeah, to worry yeah. about image. Um, <laughs> but it's those things where you go, hey man, there's sacrifices that need to happen. Yeah. And those that are willing to swallow their pride mm. or uh, make adjustments are the ones that are going to reap the rewards and benefits. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah, I, really, I really appreciate how you kind of shoot from the heart, mate, not mm. from the hip. And um, I mean, I'm, Proud that you've got your own podcast. It's great to have <laughs> another podcast right here because I can do less talking. Uh, but take me through what's inspired your podcast and how can people find out more as well, Sam? Yeah, man. So obviously our podcast is, is Scouting Australia. Is the Scouting Australia podcast. Yep. Um, it pretty much came off the back of you and I were having a chat earlier <laughs> yeah. of, of you have like almost exactly the same conversations with clients every day and multiple times a day. Yeah. Um, I didn't jump on podcasts that much like externals. I jump on a couple a year and there was yeah. a huge lot. I really appreciate it, mate. That you'd, yeah. yeah you'd. No, mate, it's an absolute pleasure. Yeah. And, and I used to jump on them like a few times a year, right? Um, and there was all that lag time in the middle where people are listening to like everyone else's content. And, and I'm very bullish on... Um, our strategy and because it's worked exceptionally well for me yeah. i see a lot of people they they go and peddle all their stories and their strategies and everything else and they haven't actually done 
what they're talking about. Mm. Um, so I'm very, very bullish on it. And that's why I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to do my own one or release an app a week. And I'm just going to smash out all the stuff that people ask me every day. Yes. And I'm just going to break down again and again um, in all the different ways in terms of um, our strategy and really what I did um, within my own portfolio as well. Mm. And then bring on investor clients for their stories. And it's just like, for one, the investor stories always inspire people. Yes. But then the ones where we're, where we're and, and showing people what's possible. Mate, there's, there's one, if people are interested about this and they make that comment, Morgan, um, who's actually my, well, my, who's actually my partner as well. Yeah. Um, but when she first started the business, man, like the business wasn't killing it. She was on 60 grand a year. Yeah. Man, she done, has done five properties, like bought five properties in less than two years. And she's got over a million dollars in net equity. And anyone can go through our bank accounts. I never gave her a cent. She did that all on her own. Nice. And she's built a million dollars net equity in less than two years with five deals. Man, not many people have can do that or have done that. And there's plenty of other investor stories. Done three, yeah. four properties in, in a in a 12, 18, 24 month window and created really, really good, um, uh, really amazing portfolios. And so I love getting those guys on. They love sharing their stories as well. And then it's just it's really just just continually pitching the same message because. The biggest mistakes I ever made in my portfolio was when I deviated from my path. So it was when I deviated from my strategy because like some great deal popped up and it was a mad deal, but it took me out of the market for two years because it was a development. Awesome. And I made, let's say I made six, $700,000 in a deal, which I did, but then it took me out of the market for, for a while where I could have bought other properties, bought them at a nice solid discount, missed a couple of markets with their run. Yeah. And so it's like, the trade-off for it was actually, uh, yeah, I made a lot, but how much did I actually lose out on? And so this is where I just wanted to keep kind of peddling the message that is, that is the right, in my opinion, the right way to invest yeah. um, and really just get yeah, breaking it down for people so they can understand it and, and, and continually learn about it as well. Well said. Yeah, well said. Yeah, the power of the podcast platform is people opt in. Mm. They consume it in their own time. But I think where you and I were talking is we could say it again, but because we're coming at them with so much information, that one intro yeah. call or that follow-up call. Yeah, yeah. They're just like deer in headlights and asking, what what can you remember? Yeah, they're like, they can't retain yeah, it. 100%. Whereas I find this type of medium, the retention is much yep. higher. Because one, they've opted when to listen to mm. it and at the speed they listen to it and a time that suits them. And, and if they love it, they can listen to it again and Correct. go, I just want to pick that up again. So many of my guys have heard them say, oh man, I actually listened to this one two or three times Spot because on. I just like, I missed something in the first one. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, like, because was, there was something else mad before it. I used to do the same thing. Yeah. I actually used to listen to people's potties and uh, I take notes. That's I, it. I literally go through in there and take notes. Yeah. Um, and there was a young fellow I hired just recently. Um, and he said, when in his interview, he's literally a client. And then we brought yeah. him in and he said the same thing when he said it. Uh, he already was reminding me of myself. <laughs> and then he said he did that. I was like, mate, you're hired. Like, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's literally me 10 As years ago. Five we hire people that are just like us. So we, <laughs> we get this company of mad people running around because you're just like me. Yeah. 100%, yeah. man. Yeah. Nah, nice. So it's, it's good, mate. I honestly love it. Um, I've got a co host on there as well, um, yeah. Jimmy. And he's just, he, again, client success story. He's done 10 properties in two and a half years. Wow. Created a ridiculous portfolio for himself. And it's just, mate, we get on there, we have a laugh and yeah. and, and we just love it. We, we, we both love property. We live and breathe it. Yeah. Just get in there and we just rip each other and, and talk property. So. I love it. I think when you just say that, uh, your partner, sorry. Was Morgan. Name? Morgan. Yep. Uh, say the stats again. How many properties? Six? She bought five two? properties five in, in less than two years. Yep. It, her, her first four were actually in 12 months. Right. Because she just stripped equity, bought, stripped equity, bought. But yep. then she had like 12 months for her to renovate and get some yep. things done and everything. But then she, yeah, so it was five properties in less than two years. Yeah. Generated over a million dollars net equity yeah. in that time frame. And she's 26. Something happens, I find when you say that to people, like the monkey brain kicks in. Mm. Or like that can't ha that can't be me. Mm. And it's like, well, why can't it be? Someone else 100%. has done it. Yes. And say success leads clues. I say that multiple times in, uh, in our series as well. Just going, why can't that be you? Mm. And uh, that's why the power of those stories where you share it, pay it forward, you inspire others. I want to say thank yeah. you very much, Sam. I know that... It's a pleasure, mate, mate. You could keep going. That's why you got your own <laughs> podcast because it just rolls off the tongue oh, for mate, you, I mate. I love talking about property. Right? And this is, <laughs> it's the best. I had someone the other day go, but well, what does Aaron actually do in the business? And then someone just, he just does this stuff, mate. And uh, yeah, we had enjoyment from it, right? 100%. Because um, we can't actually talk to that many people in the hours that we've got. Yeah. So this is a, a really good way to, to, to broadcast and go out to more people as well. So yeah. if you are interested in speaking to Sam and his team, uh, we'll include the details to his podcast or to his business and to their socials as well. So just, I always say, when you go down the path of picking who your partners are going to be, do the research. Do they align to you? I think you, you nailed it, which is have they been there, done that? Are they living and breathing what they're actually uh, purporting out there? And uh, are we aligned in terms of being a client? And do we get on and do we see the world from the same view as well? So 
I want to say thank you very much. You've been generous with your time, your wisdom, your knowledge. No so worries, mate. Um, mate, you will go very, very far. And I wish you every success as well. It's been a pleasure, Aaron, mate. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, mate. That's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron. If you found this helpful, drop us a, a comment or leave us a review. It goes a very, very long way as well. Thanks very much. Until next time, take care. Mm-hmm.